Yeah, that looks good. That's fine. Uh, okay, fantastic. Well, thanks everyone, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to let you all share in my joys. Um, so Everest uh, 2022, it, uh, it was a fantastic year for mountaineering in the Himalayas. Uh, we never had uh, the strong uh, um, winds that uh, normally come with uh, climbing these 8,000 meter mountains. And even on K2, we had uh, first South African ascents there uh, and records all over the Himalayas. So it was really a good year. Um, and we even had Remy Kluis, uh, who did a tufa. Uh, I met her on Everest, and she climbed Everest and Lotsi. So it was a, a good year for, for doing things in the Himalayas. Um, and we even had actually paragliders on K2, uh, trying to fly to the top of uh, K2. Uh, but they never got to the top, but it's still an ongoing quest. Um, and before I... Uh, go into it, I'm, I, I want to give you a bit of history about me because everyone asks, uh, how did I get into flying and why did I do it and why did I want to go and fly off Everest? So I'm going to go a little bit of back in history to um, the first time I flew. Uh, and this is my childhood, obviously. Uh, I grew up in Joburg and this is a play school uh, where I think I was Angel Gabriel, or I can't remember, but I, was, I think I was dropped in on a rope. Uh, or a high wire, and uh, that was my first sense of flying. And obviously that seed was planted, and uh, it uh, stuck with me ever since. As, as Leonardo da Vinci says, once you've tasted flight, uh, your eyes will forever be turned skywards. Um, I think I just butchered that. I can't remember how it actually goes. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then... Uh, why I got into climbing, uh, my father was a, a sea lover. He grew up in, uh, in PE and he always took us to the coast when we were really young. Uh, and he married a French, uh, a French girl, my mother, Denise. And uh, she uh, was from Switzerland and she loved the mountains. So eventually she persuaded him to rather try the mountains out. So they tried the Drakensberg out, the Champagne Castle Hotel. And I must have been about four or five when they went there. And they never looked back. They loved it so much. They went back again and again. And uh, eventually, when I was about eight years old, they, they bought a cottage down there called Heiberg Cottage. And uh, we've never looked back. And that's how uh, I came to fall in love with the mountains and do all my hiking and uh, eventually mountaineering and climbing. There were also two books that influenced me a lot in my youth when I was in my teens, uh, Annapurna by Maurice Herzog, which uh, was the first 8,000 meter peak that was climbed, um, and uh, Between Heaven and Earth by Gaston Rebuff, if I say that correctly, and that was just the inspiring climbs in the Alps in the, the really early days of, of mountaineering. Um, and so I went on to climb all over the Drakensberg and climb all over South Africa and eventually went to, on a climbing trip in Peru in the Andes where, I, I bring this up, I was climbing with uh, some friends of mine, Chris Lomax and David Davies, and it was there that I was introduced to paragliding. Uh, I wasn't actually on the mountain at the time, but uh, they climbed up a little peak with uh, Andrew de Klerk, the famous South African mountaineer, and he had a, a paraglider with me. I was off climbing some other little peak by myself. Um, anyway, afterwards we met in a Raz and uh, uh, discussing in the bar there, discussing uh, the, the sort of three days we had uh, apart from each other, and uh, they brought up how Andy pulled out this little paraglider and jumped off his peak and was down in five minutes where they had a two-day walk down. So I thought, well, that's, that's the way to go. So I came back to Joburg and uh, uh, started, uh, found a hang gliding school. And uh, they were just, that was in 1988, they were sort of figuring out themselves how to, how to fly these things. And uh, so we learned. 
uh, and that was 35 years ago. Um, now, paragliding uh, isn't just the uh, sort of want to give you an introduction to paragliding. It's grown in those 35 years. And it's not just uh, about flying and sailing around like you see the guys at Lion's Head do uh, all day long. There's uh, competitions, and the competitions uh, range. They have 120 pilots, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. And you fly a route, and the route can be anything from 60 kilometers to 100 kilometers. And uh, you have an air gate, an air start, and off you go, and the first one home is the winner. Um, in, in the simple terms, you also have cross country where uh, um, you try and fly from point A to point B, or just you start at point A and go for as long as you can and see how far you can get. And uh, a friend of mine, Neville Hewlett, used to actually um, have the world record at just over 500 kilometers. And then that was broken by, and that was done here locally in, in South Africa. And then the Brazilians broke it at around about 588. And now the Americans have it, and they set it in Alaska, I think it was last year, the year before, at 612, if I remember correctly. Um, so that is far, you know, if you think about it, just in a paraglider. Um, and there's also acro flying, which is ac acrobatics. That's quite amazing to watch, see what the guys do. And of course, there's my favorite, which is hike and fly where uh, you, uh, there are competitions all, the all, all over the world and uh, the most popular one or the most renowned one is uh, the X-Alps. And that's about a 1,200 to 1,500 kilometer race across the Alps, where you start at one point, they give you turn points down the Alps and uh, you start and whoever finishes first wins, but it's sort of a really pure form of flying and you carry your glider and it carries you and that's it. And you have to walk or fly the whole, the whole route. You can't get in a car or a cable car anyway. And it really is fantastic. And uh, hence I just punt my little one here, uh, the expert challenge, which is based on a similar sort of concept. Right. So seven summits, seven flights. I, um, decided to do this, uh, or the Seven Summits uh, came about with Dick Bass, uh, who climbed, was the first to climb them, he was a rich uh, oil tycoon, and he climbed it back in 1988, I think, or the, the late 80s, and he hired some uh, American guides, and I think they climbed them all within a year or a year and a bit. And after reading his book, I decided that it sounds like a fantastic idea to do and go and actually climb them and then try and paraglide off them. And uh, so I started my little quest. And um, just to give you a bit of history or a little bit of geography lesson, if you don't know what uh, the seven summits are, it's the highest point on each continent. Uh, so in North America, we have Denali, South America, America, Aconcagua. In Africa, we've got Kili. In, uh, in Europe, we've got Elbrus, which is actually in Russia, but forms part of the Ural Mountains. Uh, in Asia, we've got Everest. And in the Australasian uh, plate, we've got uh, Kosciuszko. And I've ringed that because there's also Karsten's Pyramid. So there's a bit of a dispute as to whether the plate's just uh, part of uh, Australia or actually a little bit of uh, Indonesia as well. And then just to educate you some more, uh, the... Uh, New Zealand uh, has been declared a continent uh, in 2017. So now there's actually Mount Cook, which I also have to go and do. So I've tried that twice now, but it's always been out of condition every time I've gone. But, uh, there'll be other times. Lucky I've got a brother that lives there. So it's easy to stay there. And obviously uh, Mount Vincent down in the Antarctica. So I've climbed all of them, uh, except for Mount Cook and, and Vincent, which hopefully I'll do in the next... Uh, couple of years. So Everest 2022 is when I decided to go. I, um, it took me a long time to get there uh, just because it costs a hell of a lot of money to go and do it. And you always look at this amount of money and think, hell, I could go to Europe 20 
times on that amount of money and go and climb mountains there. But uh, yeah, I'd started and I had to finish this journey. Um, and it's coming close to the end now. And I was lucky and with my Everest trip now, I had uh, my family joined me to, to base camp. I had all my brothers and I had my daughter. And uh, um, there was uh, seven and, and friends and there were seven of us uh, uh, trekkers who joined us. And then there was the 14 uh, of us uh, who actually, I was with Asian trekking and 14 of us uh, um, were climbers registered with them. Asian trekking is one of the lots of ground-based operators there that organize everything for you uh, basically on the mountain. And most people do it, uh, climb Everest at these 8,000 meters with these, uh, these kind of set, set, setups. So Everest is also known as uh, Sagamantha, mother of the universe. Um, and it's in Nepal, if you didn't know. And to get to Nepal, uh, I live in Joburg, so we fly from Joburg to that horrible place, uh, Dubai, where you get lost and you go mm. running around for a good part of the day trying to find your connecting flight, and uh, you then land in Kathmandu. Um, now, Kathmandu, uh, flying into Kathmandu, beautiful, pristine, and you, you're flying in through these fluffy white clouds on this particular day with peaks sticking through. And then you come into Kathmandu itself, and it's quite, a, I don't know if any of you have ever been there. So it's, it's kind of like Kai Lecha, uh, in a nice way, though. It's uh, not that Kai Lecha is not nice, but a uh, lot of crime there, whereas Kathmandu, actually, we felt very, very safe um, in Kathmandu. Very different culture. And uh, we had two days there, so we ran around shopping, because the, the Rand actually is probably the one country where the Rand goes quite far. Um, and that's just myself and my friends. Uh, and then uh, you also meet the rest of the team who are coming up the mountain with you. Uh, so there are 14 of us. A lot of uh, the other people there are Asian trekking uh, uh, staff. Um, but we meet them all for the first time. So all new friends. And uh, you get blessed. You get blessed a lot on the way up. I think I got blessed. This was the first time. I think I got blessed another six times before you eventually are allowed to start climbing Everest. So from Kathmandu, we fly into um, Lukla. Um, now Lukla is a probably it's known apparently as the most dangerous airport in the world. It's at 2,000, uh, almost 2,900 meters. So the height of the Drakensberg, 10,000 feet. Excuse me, and the runway is only 500 meters long. And once a pilot, apparently, once he, he comes over the last uh, sort of uh, mountain and into the valley, he's committed. He can't turn around. He has to land. So um, this is uh, all of us in the plane together with our new friends and family. And uh, this is what the... Uh, approach is like. But after watching a whole lot of YouTube videos, um, I had quite sweaty palms because this is what was going through my head. Ah, oh, and it stopped. <laughs> Sorry about that. That video didn't load up properly, but there's basically the plane came in and took out the helicopter. <laughs> so, um, so Lukla is a, a lovely little town. Uh, you can't get there by road. The road is uh, a three day trek away, the end of the road. So you can only fly in, walk in, and uh, yeah, that's it. And as I said, it's at around about 2,900 meters. Um, and you start, your Everest base camp trek and to climb Everest, you start at Lukla. And you, if you follow my GPS track there all the way, and you eventually end up at base camp. Um, and it's about an eight to 14 day trek, depending on how quick you're going to go. And you've got about 65 kilometers to cover. Um, and you follow the, 
the Koshi River all the way up, and then it splits into the, the Kumbu uh, um, the glacier and the, the valley. So uh, there's Lukla. We, you go past and you stay in all these little tea houses on the way. You stop at Namchi Bazaar for two days at 3,400 meters, and then again at Deng Boche at 4,300 meters. That's just to acclimatize because your, your body, and you go very slowly, you're only doing roughly eight to 10 Ks a day. Um, so you're generally done by sort of 12, one o'clock, and then you've got the rest of the day just to relax and get out of your headache. Um, as I said, this is leaving Lukla, so no cars, so there's no uh, to worry about. You only have to worry about yaks. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a very pleasant little town. Did you know actually a yak, the female term for a yak is a neck. So I think that's a yak and that's a neck. But, uh, <laughs> That's another thing I've taught you. There's two things I've taught you tonight that you didn't know. The, a neck and uh, that uh, New Zealand was a continent. Um, and as you get higher, you'll notice the vegetation changing throughout uh, the walk. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna start, so I'm gonna show you a whole lot of slides, uh, just flick through them and I'll comment. If you've got a question, just ask. Um, so that's myself and my brother and my daughter. Uh, just before we start, we leave uh, into the park and, and start our hike with our other 21 compatriots and their uh, and the Sherpas and porters. Um, I'm sure that's a neck. She looks really beautiful. Uh, and actually, this uh, she's carrying bags. So this is how our, our bags are taken to base camp, either by a yak or a neck or a porter, or they get helicoptered in. So our bags all went up, uh, they got helicoptered in the main bags and then our trekking bags, um, we carried ourselves. Um, so I'm just gonna flick through slides. So Nepal is mainly a Hindu, sort of 80% Hindu, and you get a lot of these um, sort of shrines on the way. And we were asked very politely to pass them, always pass, them on the left and if you come to one of the spinning prayer uh, wheels you always spin it clockwise not anti-clockwise so this is something that i learned and these shrines are probably every kilometer so if you're approaching from the other side you're then approach on the left from that side which is and, and the two paths some of them are quite easy and you're always tempted uh, to take the easy one and uh, so the left one could be a lot harder than say the right path but, uh, very, very beautiful and, and picturesque as you go up the valley. There was actually quite a lot of building going on from the earthquakes they had a couple of years ago. So it's was re-establishing uh, walls and tea houses and things. And they grew a lot of onions, uh, <clears throat> low down. You had onions, leeks, and garlic was grown quite a bit, as I was told. Yeah, these big prayer wheels. And you get all shapes and sizes. Some of them are even driven by water, so you don't even have to spin them. It's kind of a religion that you could fall in love with <laughs> if you're lazy like me. So the tea houses were really comfortable. Uh, they got a bit more basic as you got closer and closer to, to base camp. But uh, yeah, very, very comfortable. And uh, the food was very, very good on the way up. So this was, uh, I think, one of our first hanging uh, sort of suspension bridges. We're all very excited to get on and swing that uh, bridge a little bit. And yeah, amazing. Everything goes across there, even the yaks and the donkeys and uh, yeah, all your transport. And early on there's in the forest and that, there's lots of rhododendron trees and bushes.
So prayer flags are also put up as part of their religion, as well as the scarves. It's your scarf is blessed. A lot of people tied onto the bridges, as you can see. Apparently, your prayers go off in the wind. So you can see the porter there carrying uh, supplies to one of the tea houses. I'd hate to know what that weighed because there was milk. It wasn't just Rice Krispies. There's a lot of heavy stuff on that guy's back. Uh, this is our expedition doctor, Christian, and uh, his wife. Uh, and that's the famous friendship bridges that uh, I think China put up for them. My brother looking happy before he gets uh, his headache kicks in, must be. So the mountains in the background that you see are roughly 6,000 meter mountains. So you look at that and you think, wow, I still got another 3,000 more to go to climb Everest. So really, and the gorges are really deep and uh, it's quite an amazing place. So then we eventually got to Namchi Bazaar after a couple of days. And Namchi Bazaar is uh, it's at 3,500 meters, so 11,500 feet. And it's the main trading uh, town in the, in the area. And it was our first acclimatization stop. And uh, it's a beautiful little town full of uh, coffee bars and uh, bars and uh, little, lots of little shops and climbing shops. And it had museums. You could go and visit. Really, really interesting. Yeah, so we played a lot of chess and uh, other board games on the way in and walked around. She saw sights on the way up. So this is leaving Namchi Bazaar. We're on our way to the next place. <clears throat> so we're at Namchi Bazaar and we then go through past a couple of tea houses and eventually stop at uh, Dengboche for another two days of acclimatization. Uh, so some more slides. I'm just going to flick through on our way to base camp. This, uh, interestingly, the Nepalese government sends us out to each operator uh, and lets them know the amount of people that are registered to climb uh, to climb Everest. So at this point at Namchi Bazaar, we had 200 registered uh, permits had been given out. You can actually see the two South Africans there, uh, myself and uh, Remy, there were the only two South Africans that climbed it this year. Um, and by the time we got to base camp, it got to over 400 uh, registered climbers. Um, you're obliged also on the way up to stop at temples. Uh, basically, I think it's just a form of it for them to get uh, some cash as well out of uh, the expedition. So every time you go, you go get blessed and you pay uh, anything from 20 to $50. Um, and uh, you get another scarf. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, you feel you better do it because uh, you don't want anything to happen bad on the mountain. You never know, hey? And this particular uh, temple had uh, the Yeti, claimed to have the Yeti skull or, or head of the Yeti. Personally, it looked like a big gorilla's head to me, but uh, I'm sure they were roaming around in those days, way back. So here you can see some porters carrying some kit. Uh, each bag there is roughly between 15 and 18 kilos. So he's got about 50 kilos on his back. Uh, and they just put the strap around the top of their head. I don't know, if I was a chiropractor, I think I'd go and open up there. Eh? 
definitely going to have problems later on in life. And this is at around about 4,000 meters that these guys are carrying this sort of load. This is another one of these uh, shrines that you have to walk past. You can see all the, the inscriptions there on the stone sort of tablets. That is our high altitude doc, Dr. Sean. And he's gonna come up the mountain with us. Uh, he's feeling a bit under the weather um, because my friend Jeremy, he asked him to crick his back and Jeremy cricked his back and cracked his rib at the same time. <laughs> So the poor guy was very unhappy uh, and ended up uh, having to sort of inject himself to get rid of the pain the whole way up the mountain. He, then, he made it up to uh, camp three and then uh, he got bad news that his mother had had a stroke. So he turned around and went home, unfortunately for him. So his trip was over, but a really fantastic guy. Uh, he used to play in the Welsh rugby team and he was an SAS soldier as well. So. A big guy, so six foot something. Yeah? <laughs> oh. <clears throat> so the path is, is actually paved uh, with stones most of the way uh, and probably stops the last two or three villages before base camp. It's nice and wide and uh, easy going, except for the ups and downs. You'll notice soon as we get out of the foresty areas, this photograph's a bit out. This is below uh, Namchi Bazaar, but uh, it gets more and more. Uh, Desolate. This was our first view of, uh, of Everest um, in the left hand side there with the plume coming off it uh, from uh, Teng, Teng Boche, uh, which is, uh, I think, the oldest monastery uh, in Nepal at the time. So when uh, you, you and your, your yaks or naks meet, you always take the inside. Don't go the outside in case they decide to give you a nudge because those gorges are hell of a deep. And they aren't the friendliest of, uh, of animals. <clears throat> So eventually we made it to um, Deng Bo at uh, 4,400 meters, roughly 14,000 feet. And we had another two day layover here to let your our bodies acclimatize. Not as uh, nice as Namchi Bazaar, but a, a nice little town in itself. Uh, also had the odd coffee shop, amazing. You get uh, cafe lattes and all those sort of things up there as well. So they definitely cater for us Western folk. So we're now at Deng Boche, and then from there we got a couple more stops on the way to, to base camp. You can see the vegetation getting less and less. <clears throat> Just after leaving that, we came over this path to all these shrines um, on, for fallen climbers, not just Everest, but all over Nepal. And they were, it's quite an eye opener to see. I didn't actually get a view of the whole, all of them, but they're just hundreds of shrines. Um, all little clocks. Uh, that was Scott Fisher. I don't know if any of you have read the book, who died in the 1996. Uh, 
Everest disasters. I took that photograph because it was the first piece of litter I'd actually seen on the whole trip. Little blue plastic bag there. Very, very clean. I was quite amazed. So this lady claimed to be the highest uh, bakery in the world at 4,500 meters. And she could bake anything. She baked a birthday cake for one of us. We had our birthdays there. Uh, yeah, it was really good food that she made. As I said, it gets a bit more rudimentary. Um, so those are juniper leaves that they put up around the, the long drop, and it uh, gives a sort of poppery smell off, potpourri smell, should I say. Um, it's a very clever idea, actually. And that was our first snowfall. This is just about two days out from base camp. Um, and the temperature, I guess at night, would go down to about minus five, minus six at the moment. And during the day, pretty similar to our South African winters, sort of uh, 15, 17 degrees during the day. So not that cold. But the headaches were now starting to come on getting closer to 5,000 meters. So this little town is the last town before base camp. It's about eight Ks uh, downstream of base camp. You can see the glaciers already. We've been walking up the glacier for the last two days. Uh, and I'll show you this because this is where I chose to land. It was the last bit of grass, sort of softish as a river sand bed there and a little bit of uh, uh, kind of like on top of the berg. I don't know what you'd call it. Um, sort of peaty uh, grass on top. And uh, I decided that if I flew off and I, if they gave me a permit, because I still hadn't uh, received my permit at this stage to fly off, uh, that's where I would uh, aim for. Because higher up to base camp, as you'll see, uh, there's just rocks, uh, just moraine from the glacier. So there's no actual nice places to land. So base camp is pretty much like what you see there, just rocks and, and scree, quite a harsh environment. As we've been going up, we've also, uh, the air gets drier and drier. And some of the team guys, uh, some of the people that actually developed uh, what we call the kumbu cough, which is this dry hacking cough that just never goes away. It just, yeah, luckily I never got it, but uh, some of the guys had it really badly. And then now, uh, Proper view of Everest and base camp. So Everest, you can see the, the yellow tents strung out along the glacier. Uh, it goes on for about a kilometer and it's about sort of 100 meter wide of just tents to accommodate 400 people and all the Sherpas. So you're looking at probably 800 to 1,000 people there. Um, and when you're there, it doesn't actually seem like it. You don't really see that many people. They stopped us from visiting. So a lot of the camps wouldn't allow you to go and visit and say hello to other people uh, because COVID was still, uh, hadn't actually, Nepal was still going through a, another wave of it. So no one wanted to get sick. So you hardly visited uh, any, any other camp. And that's a, the famous Kumbu icefall coming down. Uh, and Everest is the big black triangle at the back. So this is uh, the trek is uh, this is uh, a little rock that someone has gone and spray painted 5,365 meters to Everest Base Camp, and that's where everyone, if you look at Google Base Camp, you'll see this famous sort of picture where everyone stands on top of this rock. So I was very proud of my daughter who got all the way there, and my brothers, 
um, and then it was they spent two days with us at base camp and uh, and then left. Uh, so base camp's very basic. Uh, you sleep in these yellow tents, sort of uh, I guess one and a half meters wide by sort of three meters long, or two by three, I think probably more or less. Uh, and that was our our mess tent, is the big igloo, uh, the cook tent, the green one. The shippers were on top. Um, yeah, and I think that was our our uh, expedition leader there. Uh, and doctor, and that was the setup. Eh? The mess tent is probably where we spend most of our time because it was insulated and had gas heaters in it. Uh, the more ex expensive expeditions had two or three of these, and they would have uh, sort of pool tables, I believe, and TVs and all sorts of uh, luxuries in them because you spend a lot of your time, even though you are acclimatizing throughout the whole trip and you're there for anything between six and eight weeks, sometimes even 10 weeks, I heard. So it's a long time, sort of two, two months, maybe more away. Um, and you eventually actually start getting tired of each other because all your small talk is talked out of it. Hey? So, uh, there was Wi-Fi uh, that worked, you know, it came and went. Uh, but you, you, you had to buy it and then you worked. Uh, so on the way up to the tea houses, they had normal, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I was going to say MTN, but normal um, cell, cell signal. Uh, and then that stopped about two or three tea houses before base camp. And then base camp had its own little setup where you actually pay another, I think it was quite expensive, like 3,000 Rand for the, uh, I think they did it per, per month. So, it was almost 6,000 Rand for two months. So, um, now, when you're at base camp, you, uh, you, you spend a lot of time sitting around, but you're sort of going to, you're going to acclimatize. Uh, in other words, walk up a mountain, go higher to 6,000 meters or 6,300 meters, and slowly you get higher and higher, and you come back down and rest for four or five days, let your body acclimatize, and go off and do the next one. And the guys called this uh, rotations. And so to minimize your rotation through, through Everest and through the Kumbu Icefall, which is the most dangerous part, uh, probably of the whole climb besides going to high altitude, uh, they let, they'll take you to other uh, mountains to climb. So they took us off to a mountain called Leboche East, which was 6,100 meters, roughly 20,000 feet. And it was about 12 k's out of base camp. So we packed up and went off for four days to go and climb this mountain. And this is uh, at the base of the mountain. This photograph was taken when we left early in the morning at sort of like three in the morning. Uh, so that's actually the moon shining there. Um, and it was really a beautiful little mountain to go and climb. And I thought our first sort of introduction to how they do things on these mountains. Um, and they obviously wanted to see how we performed and what, uh, how good we were on the mountains. Because they, they take almost complete beginners up, up these mountains, believe it or not. So I was quite shocked with some of the people that didn't even, hadn't even put a pair of crampons on in our, our group of uh, 14 climbers. No, I still hadn't got my permit. So at this stage, I still hadn't got my permit. And there was no, they said, no, don't even bring it out. So otherwise it could get confiscated or disappear. So uh, it was still kept away. And uh, so we did this and we went and did uh, into the ice fall to about 6,000 meters or five, nine. So we did one rotation in the ice fall and then we started uh, um, before you go up Everest proper, they give you your final ceremony where they get a, um, uh, I want to say Lama, but not Lama, a, a monk to come along and, uh, and bless you again. And each of these ceremonies are about an hour long and they beat a drum and uh, get into like a whole trance and go through the whole thing. And they, you put offerings of, I can see there's Coke there and various things to, to the gods. And, uh, 
you put all your climbing equipment out there and it all gets blessed. And uh, you then uh, you throw rice and you all throw flour in the air and uh, he comes around and blesses you with flour. And uh, so you all get white faces at the end of that uh, ceremony. But uh, it's really quite good fun. Um, and then you're allowed to go into uh, to actually start climbing Everest. And they, the Sherpas and the locals believe in this. I mean, they are, you have, you have to go through it. They won't allow you to go. And if you haven't been blessed and they bless themselves and every morning or every time you go into the ice fall, you actually have to go and go past the, the shrine and spend five minutes uh, getting blessed locally by the Sherpas before we all venture in again. So there's a lot of blessing that goes on. But I can understand it with the last uh, sort of accident that happened where I think it was something like 14 or 16 people got wiped out in the ice fall uh, a couple of years ago. So, yeah. So, this shows uh, the high cut. This is just my GPS track from Camp One, is roughly there. And that's a, it's only about a 500 meter climb up through the ice fall. Uh, the ice fall is a lot of, it's a bit of like an ice jungle gym. Uh, and they've got a group of guys that, uh, that put uh, fixed ropes through the ice fall called the ice fall doctors. And they fix these ropes right the way through that you use as your safety line. Um, I thought about it quite a bit because you're attached to it. And what happens if something falls and you can't kind of get out the way because you're attached to the rope. So it has its pros and cons, I guess. But yeah, I decided to definitely stay attached to it. There's big crevasses up there, as you'll see. Um, and that took us, took me the first time, uh, five and a half hours to get to camp one to do 500 meters in altitude gain. And it's only about a K and a half, two Ks long. So you can see how altitude affects you. Um, and then camp two higher up, uh, at roughly six and a half thousand meters and camp one at 6,000 meters. Um, now just before we went for our final summit bid. There's a couple of things uh, that have to be right. Um, the weather has to be right. You have to be acclimatized, which we did. We acclimatized ourselves by going through the ice fall up to camp three at 7,200 meters. And uh, once you're acclimatized to that, you come back down to base camp and you wait for the weather to be right. Uh, for the rope fixers, there's a team that fixes ropes all the way to the summit. So uh, it's, yeah, it, it's sort of, it's no, no technical stuff. You just have to know how to walk and use a Jumar. Uh, you carry an ice axe in case you get into trouble and something happens in the ropes, but otherwise it's not a, it's not very technical mountain. It's, I, I'd say it's a, the highest via ferrata in the world. If you know what a via ferrata is, you can get them all over Europe. Um, and so, uh, but, yeah, so you have to wait for the rope to be fixed all the way to the summit uh, if you're going to climb it in that style like I did. Uh, and you have to wait for the weather to be right. So just after acclimatizing, we, we actually waited around for about four days, five days. Uh, then the ropes got fixed and then we, we were ready to go. And we were off pretty much the day after the rope had been fixed to the summit. Uh, and that's the day that my permit actually arrived. So at that point, I was not going to fly off this mountain. I was just preparing myself to walk up it and walk down it. And uh, it arrived with uh, all it said, well, all I could read was Pierre Carter and Ken, Ken Hood, which was uh, the Australian who was also trying to fly off. Um, unfortunately, he got pneumonia at Camp 2 on his summit bid and had to turn around. Um, and the limiting thing in there, it's, it gave us our names and then it said 8,000 meters. And uh, uh, I was told that that means you can only fly from 8,000 meters. You aren't allowed to fly any higher. So flying from the summit for me was unfortunately uh, out of the question. I didn't want to go and break that rule and maybe get fined because now a president had been set. And if I did that, I would have ruined it for others that wanted to fly off. And this was the first time the government had actually ever issued anyone with a permit. So I thought, no, let me just comply with what they've done. And uh, hopefully in the years to come, we'll see more people flying and maybe they'll start relaxing. 
the, the height limit and let people fly from the summit itself. Um, and this has been done to Everest has been flown off three times uh, from just below the summit. Uh, I don't know if you, I've never actually asked uh, what happened to those people, whether they got fined. I'm sure they did have to pay a certain amount of US dollars. I know Red Bull, who paid 80,000 US dollars for someone to wingsuit off, not from the top of Everest, but somewhere on its flanks where it was steep enough to actually jump off with a wingsuit. So Red, Red Bull set a very high bar by paying $80,000 for that. but. I told them I'm not paying anything, and they governed me to, to 8,000 uh, meters. So, um, yeah. So we set up through the icefall, had my permit now, so my glider was with me. Um, so we had, I hadn't tested it out or anything. It was packed like I'd packed it, and uh, yeah, off we went. Um, I'm just going to show you some pics going through the icefall. Uh, it's quite uh, the pictures don't really show you it. it's, it's really surreal this walking through these huge ice blocks and uh, uh, this ice jungle gym as I call it but the yeah, avalanches come down um, it's all day long uh, sort of around you no, none came near me the closest was about 300 meters away um, but it was going down a gully, so it wasn't, we weren't in any danger. Um, but it's, yeah, and, but they, they're all around. They sort of start actually from about five in the morning, you can hear them rumbling away. Uh, but nothing scary, like I know some people have experienced. Uh, I never actually asked any of the local guys that actually, um, but I'm sure they have. Um, they've seen, I know in, in, in the glacier, they've seen a reduction. They told us that it was, used to be a lot more open past Gorka Shep, and it's reduced a lot in the, in the last couple of years. So um, it has shrunk in that sense, yeah. So the, the biggest threat here, if you're looking at this, is, is not what we're walking through, but it these hanging seracs high up there, sort of a thousand meters higher, because the sun hits them first. So you generally start hiking through it at, uh, you leave it about two in the morning uh, so that to make sure everything high up is, is nice and frozen and still not going to drop off and come and wipe you out. That's what wiped out all those people uh, in 2014 or 16, I think it was, um, who were walking in the ice fall when that, uh, when that happened. <clears throat> and you must have heard about all these ladders that they put across. So when Hillary and them did it, they did it the proper way. Hey? You had to climb down and then somehow get across the crevasse and climb up the other side. But nowadays they're just, depending on the size of the crevasse, the icefall doctors tie them together and you have to balance your way across. It's uh, quite daunting the first couple of times that you get. And there were probably, I reckon, 15 to 20 ladders through the icefall going across the uh, Big crevasses and they're deep you can't even see the bottom of some of them it just goes dark so a good uh, 100 meters or more deep yeah. We had different names for different areas. So you you come past like an area, I think this is coming out what we call the popcorn. I don't know if every expedition had their own names. But, you know, amongst us, we had named it, uh, this was Popcorn Alley. So they're sort of soccer ball sizes, maybe a bit bigger of all this jumbled ice that you had to sort of go over for, uh, for a couple of hundred meters. And then we had, we also had Wall Street with the big towering blocks I mean, huge, the sort of size of double-decker buses that you're going through and under. Um, I guess it, at night at base camp, it was getting in the tent to minus 10, so I guess minus 15 outside. Um, but once you're walking 
yeah, it wasn't, it's not that, I, I guess it was minus, I guess minus 10 roughly. I'd never actually uh, checked on my watch. I guess I could go back because I've got it all in the GPS. It'll have a history of it, but it was always obviously on me under my clothing, so it won't give a true reading. Uh, probably about minus 10, minus 15. Um, So you when you're walking you're sweating so you actually you actually you know you're unzipping things to yeah so it's only when you stop that uh, that you start feeling it so. uh, most of them were actually on my iphone and then this one i think was just taken i most of i've got i've taken a still shot from a 360 so i had it into the 360. Yeah, do you mind repeating your question about the question ah okay so it all, okay yeah um, so someone was asking there, uh, how did I get like this shot? And this is from my uh, Insta360. So it's just a still from that. So you just somehow that cuts out the selfie stick, which you can't see. Um, but the rest of the photographs, like these ones, I just took a little, I just did everything on my iPhone. It was just easier than having to carry another camera around. seem to take quite nice shots. Oops, sorry. This is almost coming out the top of the ice fall uh, with camp, uh, camp one just on the top here. But this was one of the most beautiful parts where you had to actually go down into the, the ice fall and then come along this little, nice little edge of, uh, of ice and out. It was very, very beautiful. So there's camp one at uh, roughly 6,000 meters, 19, 20,000 feet. Um, and that's just on the glacier. Now, this is where you enter the, the um, Western Coombe, what everyone calls the Western Coombe. And uh, it's basically a valley. So you've got ice, you're walking on ice and you've got ice on the sides. And when the sun hits, hits it, it gets hell of a hot. So you, you come out the ice fall and it might be minus 10, minus 15, and you get onto the coom and it's, uh, and if the sun's shining, it's, I reckon, probably 25, 35 degrees. You just get baked. It's like being in a, yeah, you know, it's this oven of just reflected heat that, that hits you. So you generally don't try walk around uh, in the sun up there. You do your walking, uh, early in the morning before the sun hits. So we were leaving camp one, we'd leave normally around about four, four or five, I'd leave about five in the morning to get to camp two, which was only roughly a one and a half, two hour walk away. And the sun would sort of hit the, start hitting the valley around about half past eight in the morning. Um, but on this particular morning, when I was summit day, I got, I got up to here, I was feeling fine and got to the yellow tents and I just started throwing up all over the place. And uh, so I had a really bad temperature. Um, I had a high fever and I was vomiting and then I started getting diarrhea. It was really not a good time. Eh? <laughs> and uh, it, what took me one and a half hours sort of a week earlier or two weeks earlier, took me four hours to get from camp one to, to camp two. And uh, at this stage, our uh, 14 man team had dropped to two men, two guys had dropped out and we had been split up into team A and team B, basically just because of how the speed that you walk at. And I was with team A and there were five of us uh, and team B was then gonna follow up uh, three days, four days later. So basically they don't have to put out so many tents for us uh, and then we just rotate through the tents as we go. Um, and getting to camp two, uh, after eventually I was just, you know, dry heaving and uh, I phoned uh, with the walkie-talkie down to uh, our team doctor and he just uh, went through the things and definitely wasn't altitude sickness, I'm acclimatized and he carried on asking me a million questions and he just said, well, he doesn't know what it is, he must have a virus of some sort and I must just uh, tough it out and maybe wait uh, uh, well, I realized I wouldn't be able to carry on with my team A uh, and I would just have to wait for team B to come along and hopefully carry on up with them. And that was four days later. So I thought maybe by then I'd be strong enough to, 
and well enough to carry on. So I stayed at Camp 2 and uh, my teammates carried on up to Camp 3 and the summit. And there was a window, a weather window of seven days. So we had started at the beginning of the window and Team B was coming three and a half days later, basically towards the end of the, the weather window. So I knew uh, it's, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be tight now. And uh, um, Team A uh, went on. And so to climb from the base camp, you to go to camp one, uh, camp one, Camp Two, Camp Three, and then you go up to the South Coal, Camp Four, and then that evening you then actually go for your summit. So it takes five days to roughly summit Everest. That's the sort of standard way of doing it. And uh, that's how we were doing it. So I waited my three and a half, four days for Team B to come at Camp Two. And uh, they eventually came through. And I'm just going to move us up to Camp Two. So that's leaving Camp One. And that's uh, Camp One down in the bottom there. You can see the tents. And there's roughly Camp Two, I think, is a six, six, I think. Uh, so you've got another 500 meters of, of altitude gain to go through. And I think it's about five Ks of walking or four Ks of walking. So you still got the odd crevasse to cross. So there you can see Everest up on the left uh, and Lotsi at the head of the valley. Uh, and Lotsi means South Peak, actually. So it's the South Peak of Everest. Um, and then you've got Naputs, uh, which is the ridges coming down on our, on our right-hand side. This is nearing Camp 2. Uh, Camp 2 was a bit warmer because it was on this uh, moraine uh, and, and rocky, sort of rocky area, not directly on the ice like Camp 1. So there's Camp 2. So that was my home for four days while I waited for the others to arrive. And it was just myself and the, uh, the cook that was left there. Um, I didn't, he didn't have to cook much because all I had was black tea. That's the only thing I could hold down uh, until eventually when my other team arrived, I just managed to start eating again. Just walking around camp two, feeling sorry for myself. I thought it was over when I actually got there on the first day. So Pierce was asking, uh, what were you asking? <laughs> yeah, he, he was asking whether how I felt and whether I was going to make it up or, or not. And actually, when I got there, I was so sick. I, I almost asked them to send me a helicopter to cast it back myself out. Um, and I nearly threw in the towel and called it a day, but the doctor said, no, just give it a couple of days and take lots of uh, panado and disparin to try and keep the fever down, and uh, which I did, helped a little bit. Um, but that's the last point you can actually physically get airlifted out. Uh, anything above that, you have to get out on your own steam. So I nearly called it a day, but uh, yeah, luckily I, hung in there and uh, when team B came along four days later, I was feeling a bit better, still very, very weak, but uh, I sort of was managing to hold down rice. So uh, that's a little thing at camp two. Um, now from camp two, uh, you then go up to camp three at 7,200 meters up the Lotsi face. So that's Everest on the, the left-hand side, and that's you going up the center of, uh, of the Lotsi face. And then you cross over, which you'll see now, and into the South Col. Um, so when they arrived, uh, we all then decided we'd leave the next morning, and off we went, and I joined them, and I got a hell of a week. Uh, I felt weak. I mean, they pulled ahead of me, everyone, uh, it was a couple of hundred meters with me in the first sort of kilometer. Uh, and uh, I eventually turned to my Sherpa. At this point, you, you each get given a Sherpa that climbs with you 
all the way in case something happens to you or and he carries uh, you carried your sleeping bag and stuff and he carries the food and ex extra oxygen bottles um and i was feeling so weak at uh, what we call crampon point where you the ice starts getting too steep you have to put on crampons i said no uh, let's give give me my oxygen now because i'm just uh, i can see i'm not even going to make it to camp three so he said no problem and he hooked me up with oxygen and wow it, it was it was amazing uh just the the strength coming through to my legs just from the oxygen was uh, yeah and then i managed to get all the way to camp three and uh which is roughly up uh, there um i could actually start i felt a lot better i don't know why but uh, maybe it was the oxygen and uh, i had a good full meal and uh the next day to camp four, I was uh, well on my way to recovery. So, yeah. So that is the Lotte face where you go up. Um, you can actually see a small little trail there where it goes across uh, in the in the ice and the snow there. Uh, and that's the yellow band. And then you go on to Geneva Spur, which is out of the picture. Um, and you see it up there. There's no... I think there's minimal avalanche risk there as a, the slope is a good 60, 70 degree slope, probably a bit less, maybe 50 to 60 degree slope. Um, but you're going up. So that's a view just before camp, uh, camp three going down and camp two is in that moraine there in the sort of center right of the, the photograph. That's at camp three, actually, just resting. <coughs> That's camp three, looking down the uh, Western Coombe. So camp three, they set up these tents and they dig them into the, uh, the side of the mountain. And you don't, at, uh, at this point, the toiletries kind of go out the window. At base camp, you had a toilet and uh, Went into a barrel that got taken away by the helicopters and got taken out uh, above base camp uh, everything just goes down a crevasse um, and above that you are just doing your toiletries right behind your tent for all the other hundred odd people to gaze at so and it, this uh you also have to be very careful here because you've got the 60 degree slope of uh, slope with um, it's very icy so every time you if you had to go to the toilet you'd have to put your boots on and put your crampons on and then go apparently a couple of people have uh, have died just by going out in their little uh, inner boots which are very slippery and I slipped all the way down the lotsy face while going to the toilet so And it was actually surprisingly warm. It, was, it seemed to get warmer to me. Uh, maybe it was just the weather changing at, uh, at this altitude, or maybe it's because I was getting feeling stronger. But, uh, so that's looking up from Camp 3. Um, there'll be another view. That's the Geneva Spur. Uh, and that's just looking up at some of the sort of ice, little ice walls you have to climb up and over. But again, there's your fixed rope all the way and they pin it every, roughly every 30 meters, it's knocked in with a stake. Um, and they're all tied together. So it's redundant all the way to the top of Everest. <laughs> so it's a couple of stakes pulled out, the next one will hopefully hold. So from camp three, that's where we base, there's the Lotsi face and you go up over what they call the yellow bands I'm sure you've heard about it or read about it and over the Geneva Spur and into Camp 4 or the South Col. Uh, to climb Lotzi, they have a, a group of tents roughly over there, just before, just after the yellow band and you actually go up this natural ramp that forms in the, uh, in the mountain. That's just looking down just before the yellow band somewhere, I think. Uh, it's just a feature that everyone caught you know, sort of you aim to get to that point and you know the next point and that's 
that was called the Yellow Band. It's just a band of yellow rocks. Um, and then the Geneva Spur was the spur sticking out, and they're sort of milestones you aim for. So the Sherpa smoked all the way up. <laughs> Pretty much all of them chain smoked. Eh? It's, uh, I don't know if it was just to stop them eating, or but it seemed to help with the altitude. They didn't bat battle there. Eh? <laughs> yeah, normal cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, you, you'd think you wouldn't, we wouldn't want to smoke at altitude, boy. They they cranked it out. Yeah. So that's about sort of 30 people ahead of us. Uh, um, that's the yellow band I was talking about. You climb through them, you go in this little dip. The tents for Lotzi are just hidden away there. And then you go over the Geneva Spur, which is the last little grind, and then into uh, the South Coal. So you can see the Lotzi face, I'm just going back to this, is actually, there's a little bit of snow here, but it primarily is water ice blue ice all the way so you don't you're kicking in and you only uh, your crampons just bite in there's nothing no nice big steps it's quite a quite tiring on your ankles and your your calf muscles that's on top of the geneva spur looking down the western coombe to base camp and that's uh our first view of uh the final slopes of Everest. So the South Col is just in there. And to climb Everest, uh, you go up these ramps to this little neck there, up to the, uh, uh, what do they call it now? The balcony. If you've read the books, you've heard about the balcony. And you go up the ridge line to the South Col and Hillary Step in the top. So I was now in a dilemma because I was feeling good again. Um, but I was now with the B team and the weather window was closing. So I spoke to the guys down in base camp and they said, no, tomorrow, which is our summit day, the weather is going to be closed in at about one o'clock, two o'clock. And you leave at eight o'clock in the evening before, eight, nine o'clock. And it takes you anything, depending on how fit you are or how strong you're feeling. Uh, anything from, if you're really in good shape, maybe 10 to 12 hours. And if you aren't in such good shape, 12 to anything up to 18, 20 hours, just to go up from the South Col and back down to the South Col. It's only 800 meters or just over 800 meters. Uh, so down here, I mean, it'd be quick, up and down is quick, but that's how long it takes uh, at, at that altitude, even with oxygen. So, for me, the main thing was to go there and fly. And uh, getting the summit was the you know, just an extra, an extra cherry. So I decided with the window that they were telling me about, even though I was feeling a lot better, I was, if I went, I'd probably take between 15 and 18 hours up and down. And I worked it out. So I'd only get back at two, three in the afternoon. And the weather would, as the weatherman said, it's not going to be good after that. It's because the clouds are going to come in and it's just going to be cloudy and snowy. So uh, I had to, I decided I'd stay and fly. And they said the weather would be good from seven o'clock until 12. And hopefully the wind would be light at uh, sort of six, seven in the morning, uh, getting stronger throughout the day. So I said, okay, now I'll wait because I definitely won't be back uh, by 10 in the morning or seven in the morning. And uh, I'll forego my summit bid. So with a lot of uh, FOMA, I said ciao to my teammate and they left. And subsequently, uh, they uh, did take, I think the quickest was back down by about one o'clock. Uh, and that was, a, that was two local guys, uh, two Nepalese people. And the rest of the team were round back down, they took between 18 and 20 hours. I think the latest was around about five that afternoon. So I don't know if I would have made it. It would have been touch and go. I took off at 12 o'clock. Uh, and at one o'clock, I don't know if the window was already starting to close. So it was really, so I think I made the right decision. And I did go to the fly off. So yeah, 
but it would have been nice to have gone and tagged the top. Uh, that's myself and my Sherpa in the tent. Um, we're just waiting, actually, this is the next morning, waiting for the weather to, to come right. So that's the South Coal. Uh, I think that's looking over into China. Uh, and this is, uh, I'm thinking, yeah, this is, yeah, the sun's rising in the east there. Um, yeah, that is correct. That's looking over into China. Uh, and at seven in the morning, I got up and uh, the conditions, you have to worry about conditions at base camp, sort of halfway up the mountain and then where takeoff is. So the wind, like they predicted at the South Col was perfect. It was about 20 Ks an hour, which is perfect to launch a paraglider. Um, but at base camp, it was totally clouded in. You couldn't see, they said they didn't know how thick it was, uh, but it was on the ground at base camp and I could see how high it was up and it was a good couple of hundred meters thick. So too unsafe to, to fly down and uh, make it down to base camp and where I wanted to land. So I thought about it and said, okay, I could always fly off now and just go and land at camp one and then walk the rest of the way down. Uh, but that's not really flying. So yeah, to me, it wasn't flying all the way, all the way down. <coughs> so I decided I took the chance. I said, I'll wait. I'm sure this, uh, we've had it before where it's cloudy and eventually it heats up and starts rising and breaks up and you get little holes in the cloud. So you can make your way through. And that happened again, we waited and 10 o'clock we checked and it had actually lifted and there were some holes in the clouds, but the wind had now picked up and was blowing sort of 50 k's an hour. So it was too strong to, to, to fly now. So I thought, oh, okay, well, now all I can do is wait. Uh, I can only, hopefully it'll get better. And round about top was 11, 12 o'clock, the wind, well, the tent started shaking less and uh, I thought, oh, it's actually dropping off. And we went outside and I thought, right, this, this is this is good to take off. It's it's marginal because it's blowing around about 40 k's now, 35 to 40 k's now. So it's going to be strong. It's going to need uh, some people to hold the glider down and to see me off. And uh, yeah, it was successful, and we got off. And that's uh, my flight path down from my GPS, the coloured one. Uh, I don't know what the colours indicate. I think they indicate altitude not speed, as I originally thought. Uh, and I had, we had discussed, because there are a lot of helicopters that fly into base camp, although they, no helicopter would be able to come up to that sort of altitude. Um, they were, uh, we decided I'd go around the corner here and then take an arc around, sort of keeping more on the, the uh, right-hand side or my right-hand side of the valley, uh, just in case. Uh, we happened to, to meet each other. Uh, and I did pass a couple of helicopters, but they were probably about two Ks below me, so it wasn't any problem. And uh, I've got a little clip here of, uh, of the takeoff. So the total descent, sorry, from, from the coal down to, to the bottom is about 3,000 meters. So not that high, three, three Ks of, of gliding. Uh, if you look at Kili, I take people flying off Kili, and at Kili we get uh, 5,500 meters difference in altitude. So a lot, a lot bigger. Kili is probably the highest freestanding mountain in the world. Um, so yeah. Um, right. So I've got this little clip. It has got some drums playing, which is from all that I've recorded from all the, uh, the blessings we got. Uh, so that's a sort of background tune. So enjoy this little bit of five minutes and the flight down, and then uh, we'll take some questions. So I hope you can hear it. Thank <laughs> you. 
I was hell of a tight because I had to run that 20 meters. <laughs> <laughs> Mind if I stop this and stop, like running from it? Was it okay for you guys? I'm only upset. Fine. Yeah, wake up there. I've been taking off from the south call around the corner there. Let's see, face. Cap two. Way up there. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, at least that's over. <laughs> Wait, that doesn't play very smooth yet. The sound. 
yeah so yeah just for all of you uh, watching on 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 the uh computers yeah that didn't play very well i'm sorry about that for some reason it was a bit jumpy uh but i think it gave you a good idea so sorry you were asking someone was asking something uh yeah so the flight took 20 minutes it wasn't as cold as i thought it was uh the takeoff was a bit trickier at altitude um the gliders are very more, a lot more twitchier and, and move a lot faster at altitude because they need to fly and they need to uh, the air, to get airspeed. They have to they themselves have to go very quick to, to get airflow over the wings so it starts flying. And you saw coming into land, it was also quite tricky. I, I was very scared of, get, of getting up what you call a high, a high speed stall. Um, and so I was very gentle on the on the brakes. I didn't want that uh, airflow over the wing to break off too too easily and. I end up falling out the sky uh, and the landing I fell over you just to run in those big boots is uh, is difficult uh, yeah so just yeah end up tripping over yourself uh, but at all luckily I chose that spot it was nice and soft so yeah so uh, they're asking what was my airspeed so glider flies at roughly uh, depending on the make and model, 30, 38 k's an hour. So you're always flying at 38 kilometers an hour. If you're going into the wind, when I took off, uh, even though the wind was blowing at, I thought, around about 35, 40 k's an hour, I should have taken off straight away without having to run. Uh, but I think this shows you what altitude does. Um, I had to run and I had to jump over a rock and it, it actually, I was so exhausted for the first five minutes of the trip. I was, if I put the normal sound that my mic caught, I'm just, <gasps> this is heavy breathing for five minutes trying to get my, my breath back. Um, but uh, they could have been that, yeah, it was, yeah, I guess so. But yeah. <laughs> uh, and then afterwards, when I looked at the video that I took off just before it got steep and I didn't have any crampons on. So that was also, if she didn't fly and I had to stop, I might've just carried on down the mountain. I didn't think about that, uh, but I didn't have crampons on or anything to stop, my, stop myself at, at a certain point. So, but once she was up and she was actually above me, I knew I was gonna fly. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of time to get back to the kitchen. So let's yeah. take one more question here. Lewis, maybe one or two questions from your side, and then um, we'll call it quits for the evening. And wow, what an amazing talk. Uh, any, any final question here? Is it okay if you have oxygen on the top? Yes, yeah, I took off with oxygen. So uh, the question was, did I have oxygen from the top? Yeah, and I flew down with oxygen, yeah. Uh, I've flown, uh, the question was, had I experienced that sort of the thinness of the air uh, in the glider? I have flown to seven and a half thousand meters. So in the air, I've, I've experienced uh, that sort of feeling. When she's flying properly, she's, it feels all pretty similar. It's just the takeoff and the landing that are different. Um, but she was, so I've flown off 7,000 meter mountains. And just that extra thousand meter, I, I noticed the difference. Uh, in, in, in the way she behaved. Uh, Lewis, any questions from your side? Just Nick Cowley asked um, for Mount Vinson, what would the dense polar atmosphere in Antarctica, how would it affect paragliding? Um, it won't, it'll be easier than this was. Uh, it's only at, I think that mountain's about 5,000 meters, even though it is at the poles, which gets a bit thinner, it, it won't get anywhere near that sort of altitude um, and the coldness uh, so far from other friends of mine who've experienced a lot of cold and, and they, they even had ice on their gliders. Uh, um, it's all gone well. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, no, no other questions on the side. Other questions? Um, guys, uh, any last question I'm asking? Thanks. Yeah, bottle of uh, wine for you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Um, wow, guys, nothing more to say. This was absolutely spectacular. Yes. So good. thank you. Thank you so much. For your thank time. you. Thanks to all of you guys out there. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very, very much. Cool.
Grasby, going to hit the 